This Sarah. conference will now be recorded. Thank you, and welcome everyone. Uh, to to, um, welcome to the Clean Call for Tuesday, December eighteenth, two thousand eighteen. Um, my name is Katie Boyd, and um, we are going to have a nice little presentation on the call today. But first, let's start off with them. Um, if there are any announcements or um, other things people wanted to have a short discussion about. Um, if nobody else has anything at the moment, I can start it off. I actually, Katie uh, Signer brought up a great point that we will not be having calls the next two weeks because it will be Christmas and then New Year's Day. So I'm sure most of you, I hope, will be celebrating otherwise and doing other things. Um, so we've canceled the clean calls for the next two weeks and we'll be back on, I believe, January 9th. Um, and considering we're going into the new year, we have a few speakers lined up for January, but I'm still looking for more speakers for the spring. So I'll probably send out an email to the Clean Network um, early in the new year. But if you have anything you're interested in presenting or you know of anybody that wants to present for us in the spring um, from sort of late January on, please give me a call, a call or an email. Um, probably emails best. <laughs> I'm katie.boyd at colorado.edu and I'll put that in the chat, but I'll send an email too so you can um, re just respond to that on the Clean Network as well. So looking for presenters. Uh, hi everybody, it's Jen Kretzer from the Wild Center. Um, uh, I just joined, so sorry if I, if I missed, did you already talk about AGU? No, we have not. Oh. Um, well, I just wanted to say that we had, I think, had a great um, AGU conference last week, and there are a number of people that are on the call that were also in DC. So I'm sure there is um, there is a uh, um, catching up that's happening. I know for me that's the case, um, but we did have a a great. Um, education uh, lineup of education sessions um, and I think um, and posters as well as oral sessions there was also um, we had a workshop on Thursday afternoon which um, though Frank and I kind of facilitated uh, we had a lot of participation and um, we are welcome to for feedback for anybody that was um, actually in the room and wants to provide feedback. I know that Anna was working on getting an evaluation out to attendees, but um, we were really pleased about that. And just um, thanks everyone for their hard work and for continuing to um, pull sessions together. And I, I also wanted to add that I attended some really nice uh, native science um, poster talks, as well as some of the art and education um, or art and science intersections. And so I really appreciated having, seeing some of those other spaces um, because sometimes with the AGU, there's so much, it's hard to like track on what's happening all the time. It's like so big. Um, but one of the things I noticed with the native science presentations is that, is that they did poster walks where when they had a poster session, everyone would gather at a certain time and then walk from poster to poster. and I haven't been a member of Clean for, you know, more than, I guess it's been about three or four years now, but I haven't seen us do that. I would love next year if we remember that idea, because I thought it was a great way to share um, ideas and to um, just connect with people, um, to go from poster to poster and each person like gives like a one minute overview and then you go to the next poster. So anyway, just an idea that I wanted to steal and share with this crew. So. Um, and thanks to to Annie from Cornell for being on today. So, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, Jen, Jen, uh, thanks for organizing the workshop. It was um, this is Anna Gold. This was it was a great workshop and well attended. Um, anyone who was at the workshop, please return the evaluations to Frank that he sent out. That yeah. would guarantee us to get another slot next year. But if we don't do a good job returning evaluations, that's going to be hard to ask for another workshop slot. This is Katie Boyd. I, I did my evaluation and returned it. But and so thank you, Jen, also for coordinating that workshop. I thought it was really great. Um, and to Frank, who's not here at the moment. But um, 
uh, I wanted to say I saw another group um, doing that same thing with the posters. That's a great idea. Um, and I'm also going to take your idea of trying to look through some of the some of our sessions and see if I can't try to get some speakers for the spring based on some of the work that was presented at AGU. I think that's a great idea also. So thank you. Yeah, sure. Do you remember how they coordinated the meetup? Uh, yeah, posters. I think that's yeah. fantastic. I think they sent they sent an email out ahead of time, and then they also um, put a little sign up that said "poster walk at whatever time it was." Oh. So they emailed all the poster presenters ahead of time and said, "Hey, get your poster up. We're gonna do a walk at 9 a.m." And then they posted, um, you know, kind of like the in that row um, that they were gonna have a poster walk at nine so and they had like quite a crowd i participated it on the native in the public affairs native science session and i just think you know i i would just love next year for us to think about how we can um even have more intersection between both the art and science our climate literacy sessions and even like there was a number of like native science stuff that had a lot of youth and climate resiliency work happening. So I was in, in teacher trainings and like community work. So I was like, oh, there's so much cross section. So I know I'm coming back. I'm on my AGU like you know recovery mode, but but I, but also just in thinking about the debrief from the conference, like I, that was one of the things I was taking away from it this year. And, and Jim from Mobile Climate Science Labs also uh, with next year maybe you saw this message too is please don't be shy on you're now and you'll be we'll be back at our hometown in San Francisco so I can be helpful in in be you know what you can do with a hometown uh, there's a facility across the street from Moscone Center the Pacific Energy Center which is possible to do sessions at um, you know a lot of times it's very expensive to be inside a conference center but you don't want to be too far away either so things like that if we're back in San Francisco um, please let's take advantage of what we can we can help to make everybody feel at home in the city by the bay. It, it will be good. If, if I might as well, is um, also given that um, we've got two weeks off and things, uh, there is, we are really at a place where we can go ahead and announce this, that uh, also in Washington, D.C. coming up will be pretty amazing collaboration and others are welcome to join in. Um, there will be K-12 schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, universities, two um, science centers, uh, museums, uh, NSF funded uh, participants, science research places, uh, institutions, thousands of families, press, sciences and engineers all coming together as part of Family Science Days, all focused on climate education and solutions. Um, three booths all working together. That's the AAS, AAAS conference. And um, it's also deliberately meant to be a first implementation of being able to have the leading educators or the ones that are, want to do service uh, work to serve the entire metropolitan area. So pretty good area to be working in the schools of Washington, D.C. Um, it's sort of the, our major constituents are coming together in a pretty amazing event. So I want to share that with people. Jim, this is Jen. Could you post a link to the event or any details in the chat? I can. Uh, that point, I'm, 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 as I'm saying, we're getting to the point where we can can announce it to our friends and things. As far as having a nice, um, uh, ha having that as a good web, web presence, that's going to take a little bit of time. AAAS is a little bit slow on putting that together. They're the official hosts, but yes, we will we will do that as as there's more of a web presence uh, on things. But um, the components is is what I was just speaking of. So, uh, but please, I don't, I'm not trying to hold back of like people knowing the dates or if they're interested, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it can't be, it's all, not all listed in one place at this time. Okay. Okay. Thanks. February, February 16th and 17th is the actual public days. The week beforehand will be uh, K-12 students rehearsing to present hands-on science on climate change along with uh, federal government programs and all these other people. It, I don't think the world has ever seen that many students teaching science along with scientists all on climate change. It's pretty amazing. Thanks. So any other announcements or um, discussion items that we wanted to share out from AGU or anything like that?
Great. Well, I think at this point, then we can maybe turn it over to Anne. Um, if there's nothing else, or or I'm sorry, is it Annie or Anne? Oh, it's it's either. I go by. I tend to go by Annie after people have known me for five minutes, but I'm <laughs> good <to> either. <laughs> good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, share okay. Anne's screen here, and um, let's see. So Anne Armstrong is joining us. Um, she is a PhD student and online course instructor in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University. She has a background in environmental education and has interned and worked in parks, nature centers, and residential environmental education centers. While working at the, um, Shin oh, I can't pronounce this one, Shinkotik. <laughs> Thank you. Bay Field Station in Wallops Island, Virginia. She developed an intergenerational citizen monitoring program and an oyster restoration project. These experiences inspired her to pursue a PhD to better understand the mechanisms through which environmental education fosters community. Her master's research investigated how environmental educators translate climate change communication research into practice, and she recently published a book with Marianne Krasny and Jonathan Schultz on climate change communication. She is also the lead instructor for the Civic Ecology Lab's online climate change course, and she coordinates the lab's online course teaching assistance. And she's going to be talking about her um, climate change massive online open, sorry, open online course. So please take it away. Okay, well, thank you everybody for having me on the um, clean call today. Um, it was a pleasure to meet some of you in person at AGU a few days ago. And I apologize if some of the figures and information in the, um, in the presentation today are similar or the same to those that you might have seen on the poster that I have if you, if you made it down there. Um, but yeah, so thanks again. I'll be talking today about our climate change science communication and action online course um, that we've run three times now in the last year in partnership with Cornell uh, University Cooperative Extension and Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions. Um, so before I go any further, let me figure out, there we go. Further, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the Civic Ecology Lab uh, does and our approach to online courses. So the Civic Ecology Lab began as a, um, as a group that really focused on community-based stewardship and the intersections of that stewardship with, uh, with social ecological uh, systems resilience. And so um, researchers in the lab have studied social ecological memories in, among oyster gardeners and how people uh, in New Orleans planted trees to remake their place after Hurricane Katrina. Um, but over the last five years, we've also uh, started running a series of of small to, to larger open online courses for environmental educators and other environmental professionals. Um, and that started out of our EE Capacity grant with ne the North American Association of Environmental Education and uh, the EPA. And since we started, we, we started with small courses, but have since kind of opened up the course structure and are now running courses that generally range from between 300 to 900 people per course. So the main team for the climate change course that we've run um, is our is uh, Marian Krasny, who's the director of the Civic Ecology Lab and my advisor, and uh, Dr. Mike Kaufman, who's the executive director of Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions, Alison Chatherchan, um, who is the director for Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions, Danielle Eisman, who's the program manager for uh, Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions, and then Jonathan Schult, who is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Communication and has written a lot on framing and climate change and some on the concept of psychological distance and climate change. So just a little bit about massive open online courses to begin with. So massive open online courses, um, have, has, actually, if you want to put in the chat, has anybody actually ever taken a massive online, a massive open online course? And if you did, um, what platform did you use? The massive open online courses tend to be, uh, well, they're massive. They can have thousands and thousands of people taking them at once. Some of them are, they're open, so you can you typically take them for free and then pay $50 or something similar to actually get a certificate from the course if you do a certain amount of work. 
there are several different flavors of MOOC. Um, one is a connectivist MOOC where there's no uh, real syllabus and uh, learners, it's all about co-created and co-production of knowledge. Uh, there's no, it's not, there's a, it's a guide on the side approach rather than um, sage on the stage. And there are X MOOCs, which is that, the, you know, the one, there's the one expert that you listen to video lectures from and do readings from, and then there's not really connectivity between participants. And we consider our approach to MOOCs to be um, a social learning approach. So where we have, we do have pre-recorded video lectures and, and, and pre-assigned pre readings, but we also really encourage participant-participant participant, participant connection and participant-instructor connection on discussion boards and uh, social media and through email. And I'll, I'll get, uh, as I talk a little bit more about this climate change course in particular, we'll, we'll uh, get to a little bit more about how we do that. So the, um, our, our values in general, they're the ways that we try to approach online courses, or we, we really value social learning, we value equity, and one of our course, one of our main goals is to pro promote sustainability um, through our courses. So we try and get at social learning through our course design, um, at equity similarly through the course design, and then our fee structure, which is a pay what you can fee structure. So the general fee or the recommended fee is $50, but if you can't pay that, then you just click a button that says, I can't pay that, or I can pay $10, and then you pay $10. Um, and then we try and um, promote sustainable behaviors and sustainability by um, having students complete final projects in which they apply a course uh, course information to a lesson plan or uh, for the climate change course, climate change action plan. And we are doing some longer term research to see to what extent um, people actually enact those action and lesson plans. Sorry, folks, have it, there we go. Having a little trouble with the navigation here. Um, and some of the factors that are motivating our, pro, our approach are we really would like to close the so-called online global achievement gap where, uh, you know, online or massive open online courses were sort of put forward as this democratizing education um, phenomenon in the around 2010, 2012, because anybody you know, anywhere could take a course from an MIT professor or a course from a Stanford professor. But what we've seen instead is that uh, the people who complete online, massive open online courses tend to be upper or tend to be middle class. They tend to be white. They tend to be well educated. Um, and so one of our goals is, is, you know, along with that equity goal is to close the global achievement gap and provide what support we can um, to make sure that people in developing countries have just as um, much of an opportunity to complete the course as somebody in, in New York City. Um, and so we have uh, also done some research on the on participant participant interaction and participant instructor interactions in our online courses and have seen that um, more interactions and more connections leads to intent to join professional networks. Um, and we've also seen that social support can assist participants in overcoming access barriers. Um, and we really think that, you know, wicked problems like climate change are uh, really require global engagement. And so that's one of the definitely one of the motivating factors behind having uh, trying to reach such a broad audience. Our climate change course objectives um, very broadly were to build literacy to grow um, a network and to help people network within their own communities and to facilitate climate change action. And our attended course audience was uh, cooperative extension educators and volunteers in the Northeast. Um, and more broadly, we thought, OK, well, if other people want to join that, they're very welcome to environmental professionals, students and volunteers, really anybody with an interest in climate change, we, we welcomed. But the, the intended course audience was extension educators. Um, and this is, I should say, this was funded by, this course has been funded by Smith, money from Smith Lever. So it really was, the funding really was extension focused uh, also. However, um, this was our actual course audience. Uh, our, one of our Cornell sustainability uh, social media posts went viral and we wound up with, um, we've now had people from 65 countries complete the course and the, oops, sorry, that's not the slide that I thought it was going to be. Um, 
So we've had, yeah, we've had people from around six, from 65 countries actually complete the course. And the, the majority of the people or the largest group of participants does come from the U.S. And then the second largest group comes from China. And that's because we have really strong connections with uh, campus club networks in China through some, uh, through another master's student in, in the civic ecology lab and a postdoctoral researcher. But then we've also had significant participation from the Philippines and uh, from Nigeria. And in general, we tend to get a lot of, you know, a few participants from many countries all around Africa, um, which has been really rewarding for us. It gives us a different perspective on climate change action. So just a sort of overview of what we've done of the, the how the course has been run over the last uh, last year. We launched it as a three week short course uh, and it was free at first. And so we attract we had uh, 1400 participants enroll and about 400 of those actually completed the, the course, which is pretty good for MOOC completion rates, which sometimes hover between five to 15 percent. And then in January, we expanded it to four weeks to facilitate project completion. We also wanted to add readings that because we were attracting an international audience but had planned the course for a Northeast audience at first, we needed to add some additional um, some additional content that reflected our actual audience. Um, and we had a slightly smaller or about half of the number of participants that enrolled the first time enrolled the second time. And again, had a similar completion rate, about 25% completion rate with that one. And then this last September, we just finished the, the third offering of the course in October, and we redesigned it as a six-week course with um, a couple additional course lectures, and we offered it concurrently as a one-credit course for Cornell undergraduates, which was really fun because the undergrads got to interact with people from all over the world in the course discussion forum, and um, it was that was a, a fun experience for me as an instructor to run that the course concurrently with Cornell students and international students. So I'm gonna, this is just generally where people, as I said, this is where people have come from overall. Like, like I said, we have most people from the US and then China and the Philippines. And actually I think most of those people from the Philippines took the course the first time. We had about 300 people from the Philippines enroll the first time we took the course. Um, and they wound up having a really active community group, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Uh, we don't get much participation from Europe in any of our courses, which is always interesting, and we're not totally sure why. We use um, edX Edge as our course platform uh, because it's accessible in China, and um, other platforms like Blackboard and Moodle and so forth are not reliably accessible in China. And um, this is where all of the general course information goes. That's where people take quizzes. It's where the required discussion forum is, readings, video lectures. Um, and et cetera. And we typically have a mix of um, pre recorded lectures with Spanish, English, and Chinese subtitles. These range from five to eight minutes because researchers showed that people stop paying attention after six minutes. Um, we have a generally, we, since we have such a broad audience, we try and have our required readings be pretty accessible and then offer a mix of um, more academic. Um, articles that are deeper dives as optional readings. Uh, we have a lot of, dis we have weekly discussion uh, prompts and have redesigned those over the last year to along the lines of Bloom's taxonomy to try and have some deeper critical thinking in our discussion forums instead of the kind of, um, I don't know, I'm really worried about climate change or some things like that, sort of the one sentence responses. And then um, we also offer webinars once a week with uh, guest lectures from course instructors and um, and other uh, cooperative extension partners. And those are some of my favorite parts of the course, the webinars, because those are the parts where we really get to connect with people. We also, along uh, alongside that required course platform on edX Edge, we offer additional opportunities to connect on Facebook. We have a um, one course Facebook page, which now has over 2,000 people on it uh, from the la from the three courses. We our Chinese participants use WeChat to connect with each other, and then in our uh, second offering of the course, we had uh, the Nigerian and Cameroonian students set up their own WhatsApp groups that were really active. We also um, 
because one of the, the predicting factors or one of the factors that predicts uh, completion of a massive open online course is instructor presence. And so we've, um, we've been funded to work with online course teaching assistants from Cornell. These are undergraduates, uh, although we've had some alumni and graduate students who spend the semester they, they learn a little bit about uh, global engagement and global engagement skills. They learn a little bit about online learning and they facilitate our discussion platforms both on Facebook and on edX Edge. And then they also develop a digital media uh, project as a, as a final project. Um, so generally the course topics for this course are we start with climate change science and climate change impacts and then we move to climate two weeks of climate change communication that kind of cover global like attitudes what are attitudes around the world what are attitudes in the US why do people hold those attitudes and then how do we um, how do we communicate based on that how do we communicate about climate change and then the last two weeks are about mitigation and adaptation and uh, examples of action from around the world as students plan their own action plans. We have had people um, create community groups and and the, the first time we ran the course because it was we've had some we've had some trouble recruiting community leaders or for this last offering of the course but we've had very so we've had varying success with community groups um, but sometimes they're really active. These are groups that they, they might meet on Facebook or they might meet face to face. So the Bucks County uh, PA group met, um, they met face to face and but also had a Facebook group to kind of support their networking. And then our, our climate change course Philippines group um, was really active and would post about about course material in Tagalog and share. And if you know, whenever I posted a webinar um, update, they would post it there as well. And we have similar interactions on our, our Chinese WeChat groups. They're the Chinese WeChat groups are very active and they're posting resources, questions. And then we have a series of Chinese and a group of online client Chinese course TAs who help facilitate that. We also we offer the webinars um, as deeper dives to meet the instructors. And um, the last couple times that we've run the course, we've also offered students a chance to present their to the course participants a chance to present their their um, action plan ideas. And that's been really fun. Um, and I think has been like the most, as an instructor, the most rewarding part of the course. Jen actually presented when she took the course last January. And just in terms of some of the outcomes, our completion rate, we've had about 2,400 people enroll on the course platforms. And then of those 710 participants have earned certificates. And to earn the certificate, you have to um, excuse me, you have to uh, complete the, the discussion questions, you have to uh, complete the weekly quizzes, and you have to complete a final project. And the final project is an action plan that asks people to set an outcome and then think about what resources they have, what challenges they might face, and then three activities with measurable outputs that would help them achieve their outcome and then have a little paragraph about what their plans for evaluation might be. We um, do a pre and post survey with participants and ask them to just rank their their self rank how what they think of their understanding of climate change science of climate change communication and of climate change action. And so we can see in all of the courses here, there's some shift in people's and what people think they understand about uh, climate very broadly about climate change science communication and action. So this is not actually a liter a, a test of literacy, but at least people think they know more about the topics. Um, and then I think one of the things we see is that since the climate change science information in the course is quite basic, people tend to mention the the communication and the action aspects more in their in the qualitative responses um, than the climate science. I think a lot of people who come into the course know a little bit about climate change science to begin with. Um, so this person is saying, I've learned that a person's identity can play a role in their perception of climate change. This could also be just my personal bias coming through because my specialty is the climate change communication and not the climate science. Um, since one of our goals is, is networking and, and participant connections, we look at, we ask participants to list um, people who they've with whom they've connected over the course at least 10 uh, up to 10 people with whom they've connected over the course of the course and um, so this this chart is just showing that 
about 380 participants or about 380 participants of the total number of people who com have completed the course connected with at least one individual and roughly 10 percent or you know 70 people connected with uh, 10 at least 10 participants so that could be better but it's not too bad and in terms of what people have handed in for their climate change action projects, we have a pretty wide variety of projects. Um, so, but m I, as I'm going to show the variety with a caveat that most of them in reality are very literacy based, people wanting to run awareness campaigns um, rather than actually um, engage in a mitigation act action or an adaptation action. So for, we've had people um, do uh, regional climate development models or their their action plan is to try and develop a regional climate develop a regional climate model this is from the us um, we have a lot of afforestation projects in africa this is an example of a forest and soil management mixed with um, beekeeping in tanzania and um, along those lines we've had uh, in nigeria and cameroon a lot of um, several projects looking at to um, replace charcoal with green charcoal and so cut down deforestation rates that way. Um, our, we had a lot of students involved in our Filipino groups and they were very involved in climate change awareness campaigns on their campus and um, this is actually this is not from there these pictures are from uh, not from the projects because I don't have permission to use those pictures yet. Um, but this is the picture is actually from a Filipino 350 350.org uh, event. But there so there are a lot of Filipino students who are running climate change awareness campaigns on their on their campuses. And then in in China, we had in this last course, a student who wanted to do a veggie Friday to cut down on meat consumption among her her peers. In terms of what people think, uh, say they're going to do with the course in terms of action, um, this person said that it gave the course gave them a little bit more information on climate change and its current and potential impacts. But the biggest thing that I took with from it was trying was the push to make the action plan. Um, and since we've had, I think the as I said earlier, the the key audience that we were trying to reach was cooperative extension in the Northeast and of the extension audience that we did wind up reaching we've had a lot of um of interest from the horticulture and from master gardeners involved in cooperative extension so um, and since cornell has developed a garden-based learning uh gardening and warming world curriculum that uh, we could we link to during the course people really tap into that and there's actually now a course lecture about it people really tap into that who are involved in horticulture and so we've had several master gardener volunteers who have taken that and run with it that and their action plans are to um, do more gardening in a warming world workshops um, and then we also see sort of the more instead of instrumental use of the course material it's kind of just a mindset um, so this person said i wouldn't say it's a specific idea that i've used they're trying to cut down to on their emissions more during the course um, this person says that i took the bus to work a lot more during the duration of the course and i hope to continue to do so um, which leads us to the question of okay so if that what's that's happening during the course but uh what happens after the course and i'll talk a little bit about that in a couple slides this last time that i we offered the course i decided to include some climate change actions pre and post just to get a sense of what people are already doing and whether that shifted at all during the course of the the course and it did a little but i i'm taking these all with a, a big grain of salt because um the, the 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 biggest changes were here down at the bottom and this was just a check uh check everything kind of kind of question um, so people after the course that they they were teaching more about climate change, and I'm assuming that's because they are uh, their action plans tend to be literacy based, and so that involves climate education. Um, they say that they're limiting heat and AC at home more at the end than at the beginning, and that could be because we offered the post survey in October, late October, when in the northeastern, you know, when in, in the northern U.S. it's getting chilly. Um, and then they say that they've joined a climate organization. They're now a member of a climate organization, but 
that we could be the climate organization. So I'm not totally sure what that what all of the these means these mean yet. Um, and we'll probably do this differently in a future course. We are investigating long term in impacts to all of the courses and last in the uh, in June ran a survey for participants who have come who have participated in in any of our past online courses looking at the extent to which the course affected um, their current environmental education or related practice and um, their global engagement skills and their self-efficacy. So in terms of takeaways from the from the course itself, um, I think we've been able to reach broad audiences uh, with our course platform. Participants report some improvements in their understanding of climate change, science, communication and action post course. Most participants connect, uh, not mo that's that's an over that's an overstatement. Many participants connect personally with one um, and then most participants connect with fewer participants. Uh, there was a small change in self-report of climate change action for the September 2018 course participants. I'd like to uh, acknowledge our advisory team from Cornell Cooperative Extension. We developed this course in partnership with um, Cornell Cooperative Extension members, as well as some other Northeastern Extension members and the Northeast USDA Climate Hub. And then our course administration team at the Civic Ecology Lab, who answers tons and tons of emails and helps people with technology and sends out hundreds of certificates. And then our, our postdoc, um, UA Lee, who is um, helping me do some research on the course and is looking at the broader impacts of our online courses in general. Um, so that's what I have for today. So thank uh, that it was a little bit shorter than I anticipated, but thank you so much um, for listening and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Annie. That's so cool. So let's see. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Okay, I'll jump in. Jim Callahan, climate, Mobile Climate Science Labs. <clears throat> um, so how about, how does this sound to you? So I'm, I'm uh, willfully admitting that I'm making a statement, but to see what you're saying. Okay. Um, it kind of in, inviting, if, if others think this, I'll, I'll this for the other people too, inviting to make reference to CLEAN in what you're doing, because what you're doing is ex, is extraordinary. It's a it's a great program. I think that your emphasis on that, how you're reaching international, that's just very welcome and very astounding. If people were to look at the CLEAN network, so again, people can speak up to see if I'm misrepresenting. I don't think any of us, if you were to look and say, hey, this is mostly United States network right now, that any of us would go around and say, you know how I would describe myself as a xenophobic nationalist? <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm, we have very much been speaking about how to connect with both individuals and programs internationally, but also connecting with other networks. It's recognizing, and last last week was talking to people who are COP24. So, I mean, the fact that you are reaching out to so many international pro people and programs is know that there are people at Clean and things that, are, that would be great, that would welcome those connections. And especially if they're looking in climate awareness and education, to know that there are fellow educators who want to help each other. So we want to do that. So, So my question is, how does that sound? Oh, that sounds awesome. Um, I'm not, I should have said at the end, I'm not totally sure what the future of the, the course is going to be. Where, um, I would have, so the, our, our website is for some reason down right now, but we should be announcing a fellowship in the next, uh, for next spring, for the spring semester that will be based on looking at drawdown.org solutions. I'll get to, don't worry, this is, I'm sorry, this is like a lengthy answer to your question. Um, we'll be, look, have people, a smaller group of people looking at drawdown solutions in their area and trying to apply those and influence their social networks to also do something about that drawdown solution. And then in the fall, if we get funding where we have a grant in to run the course as a semester long course for Cornell students, but we would also do something run it as an online course. I'm not sure whether it would be a full 12 week, but pro likely be a six week online course as part of that semester long course um, course package. And then, yes, we do. I, I, I do highlight CLEAN as a resource, especially for people who are formal educators who participate in the course. And then it would be really awesome to 
connect more, but it would be really awesome to connect better with clean during the course. Yeah, that's Thank great. You. And I, I, go ahead, oh, Anne. So that, yeah, that could be, you know, we, we, I, we tend to post it as a resource on the Facebook page, um, but it could be easily embedded into the, we have, I, I have people for, for discussion question assignments, I've had people look up resources and then report on them. And so one of the things if, if like it'd be like a formal, if you're a formal educator, check out clean, what resources have you found that might meet your needs kind of thing. I have another we'll, idea, Anne. Um, oh, sorry, Jim. No, 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 please. I spoke enough. Um, this is this is a great idea, Jim. This is Anna Gold here. I wonder if um, if you might be interested in you know having one of the clean team members offer a presentation, you know, twenty minutes about a little tour of clean to anyone who is interested. Yeah, that would be great. So we could um, totally do that. That total that fits in well. A twenty minute. We usually our webinars. We try and make our webinars really interactive. So we typically have about a twenty to thirty, like thirty minutes at the max presentation, and then offer a lot of uh, opportunity for discussion and chat. And every now and then, toy around with the small groups Zoom feature, which doesn't always work. <laughs> I had a, another question. This is Katie Boyd. Um, so you mentioned a lot of, it seems like a lot of international engagement and participation, which is really cool. I was just curious in terms of like, I know that with the MOOCs, you mentioned this, you know, that um, only so many people usually make it through to the end and get the certificate and all of that. Um, did you see any sort of differences amongst like, were there more international people that stuck it out or more US or like, was it sort of similar between the per percentages of that or did you look at that at all? I've started looking at that, but I haven't finished. And so my, I, I don't have, I haven't looked at that for the last course for the six week course that we offered in September. When mm -hmm. I started looking at the three week courses data, what I noticed was that people who completed, people who had less experience starting off or who, who said that they had, I think it was like one, a zero to one or one to five years of experience were more likely to complete the course than people who had more experience, which just said to me that the course material was relatively basic and so didn't meet their needs. But I think what that winds up doing is um, making the course material more accessible for people who are English language learners or you know English isn't their first language. Uh, so what I that's what I really like to see, but I haven't totally done the analysis to I have it kind of set up in but I haven't done it for all of the courses yet. So I don't want to I want to say that that's true if it's not. Yeah. That would definitely be my goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really neat that so many of them sort of started their own little groups and just seems like it was, you know, because um, I could see the language barrier being an issue, but I was wondering if some of that sort of engagement amongst the participants really helped to, like you said, build that kind of community that they had as participants and be resources for each other and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think so, especially with our Chinese students. Um, we have a so the majority of the Chinese participants who take the course are university students and they have varying levels of of English language abilities and so the WeChat groups are are essential and then actually are the Chinese course TAs will summarize the readings in Chinese and then post the, um, the their reading summaries on WeChat and they'll also summarize some of the main discussion threads and post those to WeChat as well so a lot of the, the Chinese online course TAs are really essential, I think, in um, in in helping the students with that with with the courses. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions for Annie? Yep. Yeah, this is Jen. Hi, Annie. Great presentation. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question because it's it's really. Um, I guess thinking about the application for just using this as a vehicle to reach people around climate change. And you said that um, initially when you started out, it was really about reaching extension. And then all of a sudden it like went viral and you had all these other people. Are you guys thinking about like, are there different 
are you seeing different levels in, of engagement depending on where people are? Like, are people in the U.S. more engaged with the online platform? Are people that are, I don't know. I just, I'm finding this like idea of using this online platform piece for education around climate change and then creating these like, I don't know, country hubs, like just really compelling. And I'm just curious about the app or and if you've seen any differences across the board around level of engagement, depending on where people are. Yeah, this is pretty, this is going to be very anecdotal. I don't have, I, I haven't, um, this is, this, what I'm about to say is, is definitely anecdotal. So my sense is that the this last course when we had fewer it's i don't see any systematic i haven't seen anything systematic in the courses so in the three the three times that we've offered it so it seemed like the course that when you took it in in january last year we had our our students from af from all of those different countries in africa were really really engaged they were posting on facebook a lot they were very active in the whatsapp groups um and really like meaningful and and deep conversations in the WhatsApp groups. And, and then this last time that we offered the course, they were not nearly as active. And so I'm not sure why that was. And I, and, and I'm not sure whether we just had a few kind of key influential key leaders in mm -hmm. the, in the um, course last January who were willing to do the the WhatsApp groups and post frequently on the Facebook group that kind of made people feel more well, that made other people from Nigeria or other people from Cameroon feel more welcome and reduce any identity threat that they were experiencing. Right. And maybe we just didn't have those people in this course. Hmm. Um, so I would say for the last, for the six week course, it was definitely very US heavy in terms of participation. But I think for the last, when we offered it a year ago in January, I wouldn't say that that was true. I think that people from I think that the international participation was much more dynamic. Right. And I'm also just curious, sorry, I have another question. If you've tapped into any like teacher networks, like specifically, I, I, I guess I know she, I don't think she's on the call today, but like Reb Anderson, who's the director of education for Alliance for Climate Education, they did a, um, a, a very specific climate communication for teachers um last year you know so they were very specific about like this is who we're targeting and i'm what are has this been advertised like a lot more broadly and so you're looking for anyone with an interest in climate change yeah and we tend to um our i think our our go-to educator network is the north american association of environmental education which right. may mean that we would I think we've sent the announcement to NSTA, um, but we probably, we we are, since the lab itself is relatively environmental education focused, those have been the groups that we've reached out to, which means that we haven't done as good a job at reaching out to formal education networks. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the goal for the future. I think was we we have had, we haven't been able, I think if we were able to figure out how to offer this is for continuing education credits, then we would really be able to. Um, oh. Well, that's it. actually not hard. Well, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it looks like at a national scale because the, like the wild center, we just got certified through New York state to do it for CTLEs and you just apply, you know, you just apply through your regional BOCES and you become a provider. It might look differently from a, university perspective, I would be kind of surprised if Cornell wasn't already, but that's like, a, we can have a side conversation about that. Yeah, I don't, for the, when we started inquiring about it, we were given this sort of insane price tag for it and we were from Cornell. Oh. And hmm. we were kind of like, uh, okay, well, I don't think people are gonna pay $2,000 for that. So the conversation sort of stopped, but I need to do, I need to do some more sleuthing. Okay. Well, we can we could talk offline about that because we yeah. might have. Uh, I don't know if it would match up or not, but we'll, we'll talk later. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. It's a great idea. Any other questions for Annie? I'm pausing, Jim. Again, I can throw another one. I can. I'm pausing because I I think I've had my my share. So I'm just, if I can take seconds, <laughs> is um, first of all, I I think. 
this would go for other people as well that that it, when asking questions like uh making connections to clean i i think th that clearly goes both ways you are you are doing so much for the environmental education community your your work is doing things that the rest of us aren't accomplishing as well or not doing at all um you're you know the, the pro i'm looking at the content and things is wonderful um so there's a thing of if we're saying connect to us, it's like that also means we help you, right? So please, please do ask. Please let us know things that you're having trouble with or something. Like There's a lot of us who have a lot of connections doing a lot of things on, on that. So here. Thanks. So, go ahead. I, I would say that, that Clean has been really helpful. Um, well, I usually advertise the course through Clean, but then also, um, so there's that aspect. But then also, I think when I've, I've had questions about people have sent me really cool media literacy lesson plans that I haven't yet done anything with but would really like to do something with and it um i've got and, and I've, i think i've asked for a few other suggestions for resources related to the to the course and then also related to our book um and have it have it's been great i really appreciate the the listserv and i'm uh impressed with always like very i know it takes a lot of work so thanks to all the listserv facilitators So on the thing of that you are connecting well on an international level, right? I mean, I'm sorry to put emphasis on that, but that is just so – it stands out as being something that's really, really, really special. That means so much to us. I mean, one is how we have a reach, but it's also remembering that we learn from that rest of the world, that connectedness, that we see everything from one country's point of view. We're not – we don't have the right perspective on things. Um among the among the things that that I would have a curiosity is is, a, is seeing how the trend that we're seeing a lot in the United States do you were you encountering this one of the trends I'm seeing and talking to a lot of fellow educators is, is a lot of kind of a pushback of we don't really need to spend much time on science anymore um, what we need to get is to the solutions and so on I'm of the opinion we need to cover it all. Um, but there's a lot of, of uh, or, or that science is basically what science is about is getting people to the point of where they say that global warming and climate change is real and they'll check it off on a poll. But after that, there's not really any need for science. And so it's kind of like seeing, does this, do you get anything from this from the international level? Is the other one is like, okay, so say we're, we're in on this. We want to devote our lives to, to dealing with things about climate change and global warming. When we have solutions, we have innovations, we have put our money into things when we do stuff. So how do we make our choices? Is it based on trial and error? Is it based on our instinctual gut? How do we make choices if it is not based on science? Our science needs to be up to that standard now. In California, I, we aren't mainly aiming at trying to convince people that global warming is real. It is, so what do we do about it that scientifically sound based things how do we tell the difference when i go to our city council meetings all the city council say they're always passing resolutions that we believe of climate change we have to go in there and say yeah but when it comes to doing anything we're not actually doing the right things we're not using the science in our policies and what we're doing do you do you get that same from the international thing of oh we don't science we don't really have to teach the science because we all are believers is that kind of thing? It's um, learning from the rest of the world I, you know what? I, I don't know if I've, I, but this doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I don't think that I've had that conversation thread pop up. Um, I think people who, the, the people who take the course tend to be alarmed and concerned to begin with. Um, and are, and actually I, and, and are get kind of stuck in the convincing like we need to convince the deniers kind of rhetoric. And so we try and I try and push people past that. Um, so I, which doesn't totally answer your question, but I think that's the more common thread is the. And so what we wind up doing is saying, OK, well, but there is that there are not that many of them. So let's focus on the people we can work with and then address solutions with those people who are more likely to come to the table to begin with. So I think that's a more common thread than what you're what you've described um but it doesn't mean that that doesn't exist i think what's been interesting is sort of hearing people's the similar sort of identity-based phenomena going on or you know around the world but in different ways so our um like in our in nigeria people have talked about how 
people deny people are less likely to accept climate change because they think that it's it's either it's created by white men and it's either it's just a fabrication of, of white men or it's a or it is a, you know a, the the global north's fault and so they shouldn't do anything you know they shouldn't have to, to act or they shouldn't do anything they don't they, they aren't the ones who, who need to be taking the action which of course we know is there's some there's definitely truth to that so um so I think we get we get those conversations and and so I think the most interesting what I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is the interest some of the interesting most interesting things that I've seen globally have been sort of the universality of the the issue of trying to of, of the difficulty of getting people to act on climate change and that maybe for different reasons for slightly different reasons globally but there are a lot of universals there as well hopefully that made sense it does Thanks, Ann. So um, I'm actually going to go ahead and cut us off here unless somebody has a dire question. Um, but thank you for putting your email up. I'm assuming it's all right if people contact you if they do have further questions or discussions that they want. Is that true? Yes. Great. Um, and would you mind sending me or Katie your um, slides from this and we could oh, sure. post them on our website? That would be great. And then we'll put it with the recording so people could follow along. Um, so I wanted to, first of all, thank Annie so much for presenting today. Um, but I wanted to take just a minute at the end here to actually recognize Katie, who we realized at the beginning of this call is going to be, um, this is going to be our, her last call with us as our clean ESIP fellow. So um, I just wanted to tell Katie, thank you so much for all the work you've done over the last year. And we really appreciate it. And um, she's graduating. So we all wish you luck into the future as well. Um, so I just wanted to sort of take a minute at the end here to do that and still have us end on time. So thanks, Katie. It's been so <laughs> lovely facilitating for clean and great to have you on board now too. So thanks. Yeah. Do it. Um, yeah, please stay a part of the network, you know, email yeah. us and let us know what you're doing. And if you ever want to present in the future or, you know, come on the calls, feel free. We'd love to have you. So totally. I will definitely will do that. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. I want to recognize the time and um, just make sure we all can get to our other things because I know we all probably have a lot to get done this week before we leave for our vacations and such. So happy holidays to everyone and we will see you in the new year. Happy Thank holidays, you. everybody. Bye. Uh, Thanks, Bye. Annie. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you all.